you hear how loud this obnoxious, terrible old AC is? Um, anyway, this chapter was definitely a shorter one, but by God, was it a masterpiece. Um, incredible 10 out of 10 climactic chapter. This feels like the true, like, ending of the Egghead Island arc. Like, it feels like it, it just thematically and spiritually, it just climaxes everything so perfectly. And I know I said a lot of uh, those same things about last week's chapters, but this was really the tip on the, the tip of the, on the icing, uh, icing on the cake. I'm, I'm mixing up my analogies of, uh, of that. It was absolutely beautiful. And, like, it really just thematically, like, really connected everything from the whole series up until now you know it really brought all the factions in all the elements in really like and it affirmed that the one piece is paramount to the ancient history of this world and recovering what was lost in the void century and saving the world from emu and all the flooding that's bound to happen like it confirms that the one piece is intrinsically tied to this and um and essentially like taking all the different extraneous themes of like the you know fighting against fascism and that whole conflict with the sense of adventure and exploration and all the rogers legacy joyway's legacy and combining all of this together to culminate in you know the ending of this chapter which was <laughs> so fucking amazing and um it really actually serves to lend cre more credence to my theory that the one piece is essentially instructions on how to assemble the three ancient weapons um and just to clarify on that theory a little more just so it's laid out in one of these videos or something you know um god i, I know it'll get really hot but i'm gonna turn this off it's so so loud <laughs> anyway see how much more quiet and peaceful it is anyway um yeah um, so my theory is that it, the One Piece is instructions on how to assemble the three ancient weapons to destroy the Red Line. Um, and I think the reason Roger left is because he was dying, and after all of that journey that he took, and after all this time and adventures and effort that he invested, he found out he was indeed too early. Um, I think the reasons might not necessarily be clear, but I think, um, you know, one, obviously, um, might, maybe the Nika fruit the whole Joy Boy situation is definitely part of it. I think another element it, uh, is Wano's borders being opened. And I think that why Wano's borders being opened isn't just simply letting anyone into the country. I think it's more of a matter of physically allowing the water to rise or lower. I can't remember exactly. I, I, I feel like there was like a whole like established theory discussion on the internet floating around about this. But I feel like it's more of logistically letting opening up the old Wano country that's underwater um to be able to be accessed again um so I think that's part of it and that's not something that they were successfully able to do at that time yet and um and then the I just totally lost the trade <laughs> oh, oh, oh um and then the third and final thing is that Shirohoshi isn't born yet and she is one of the ancient weapons herself. So um, I feel like there's a few elements as to why it just wasn't possible, why they left. That's my leading theory. I can most definitely be wrong. And I would be totally fine if I was wrong. Um, and very likely that I'm wrong. You know, but I feel like this whole chapter led credence to that. Where it, And I feel like that solution would really tie in all of the narrative themes and threads from the series so far into one cohesive narrative. Um, and... Yeah, this was just such a beautiful conclusion. And the whole way that Bonnie and Luffy uh, teamed up to, you know, I knew that this wasn't the end of the Gorosei, of course, but at least it seems like they defeated one. And think about how much effort that took just to get one down. Luffy in his maximum form, like final form, couldn't take down one. You know, he needed Bonnie's help. And, um, and the way he inspired and like, you know, and I've talked about this in other chapters, the way he inspired and, like, really supports Bonnie and, like, really, like, gives her the hope that she needs to keep going is just so beautiful. And it really does lend the credence to the theory that she's joining the crew and she'll be sort of this Luffy spiritual successor in the end. Um, the person to carry his legacy kind of like, um, like Shanks was with Roger, you know? 
um, like a child character that's on the crew that, you know, I, I could most definitely see that. And I could, I could even see that if Shanks lets Luffy keep the straw hat, which I could definitely see, um, then I could see Luffy passing the straw hat down to Bonnie. And that would be absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah, I'm going to pull up the chapter now and go through a few like notes, uh, points of note, because um, I think that's always been helpful in these videos to get my thoughts because I'm not taking any notes. These aren't like my Professor of Thrones video where I'm like extensively writing like pages and pages of script here. I'm just going off the cuff of my brain. Let's see if I can position this here. Yeah, okay, I like how they're, like, going to all of the places, like, like, they're showcasing all the places that we've seen before, like Alabasta, Fishman Island, Skypea, <laughs> like, we haven't seen Skypea in so fucking long, and so Vegapunk brings up an interesting point here about those with rare and unique racial ancestry are relentlessly being persecuted in Slaughter Day due to some mysterious quirk of history. Now... Um, I think there's a couple of things that could be happening here, and specifically the what is shown as the Buccaneers, Whitebeard. Uh, Whitebeard is referring up to the Lun Lunarians, and we see King, of course, and we see... Um... Oh my god. How am I blanking on her name? Oh my god. I... Pudding. Like, how do they like a pudding's name? How did that happen? Anyway, yeah, pudding we see, um, and so there's a few like a few different races here. Um, there's a popular theory floating around right now that um, Whitebeard is a buccaneer himself, and I could definitely see that just given Kuma's physical characteristics in comparison to Whitebeard. Um, most definitely very like likely and plausible theory, but even if that's not the case, Whitebeard is directly referring to Lunarians here, and then we see. Um, King here, um, who seems to be the last surviving Lunarian, but, um, yeah, so very interesting. I have a two, couple, two theories here. Um, I think one is that perhaps these were the races that comprised the ancient kingdom. Um, and like the, like the descendants are from the survivors of that, which probably is most likely a genocide from the groups that would become the world government. But I also think that there's a chance that the ancient kingdom is just one of many, like maybe like the, the D tribe is just one race or something like that. And that the ancient kingdom was that race and that, um, and that the, the groups that would compose the world government were looking for essentially human hegemony in the world. And that they were trying to wipe out the other races to sort of create a world in which humans were the dominant power. So I could see that as a possibility as well. Um, I could see in like their ultimate purest form, like the Nika ability, um, being able to manipulate standard humans essentially into becoming something more and like the ultimate extent of that that dream so like like maybe like like he like like this final like nika ability and also combined with bonnie's ability somewhat in the past could have been like oh we'll give this people wings or we'll give this people three eyes and like it comes from a descendants of that um so those are a couple of just ideas that i've been tossing around in my head related to those races um um but it's all, like I'm saying, all of these things, all of these story threads are coming together beautifully and really interconnecting here. Um, let me see what else is going with what I wanted to talk about. Um, so I think I'm just going to wrap up with the final page, which is absolutely beautiful, and um, cover that. So it all depends on who finds the one piece. I'm showing all these key players here. Um, of course, we got the, you know, the four Yonko, current Yonko, uh, we got, uh, you know, I like how they showed Figarland, um, here, we got, uh, Sabo, we got, um, Aokiji, um, Kobe, Dragon, Emu himself, um, um, Akainu, um, but notice there was a figure here I didn't mention. Who is that? We clearly are being obscured. We clearly are not meant to know who this is. I have a couple theories. 
and also credit where credit's due to the One Piece group chat I'm in with uh, Alberto, Jen, and Daniel, um, where we've been tossing around some of these theories. But um, yeah, I think it could... A theory I have is that it could be who I believe to exist, but might not necessarily exist, a Shanks twin brother um, that is a celestial dragon or a god knight. And that maybe for Garland um, had two twin had twin sons and you know i feel like that would be very thematically per precedent of them to you know have one that grew up as a celestial dragon and gods and one that grew up as a yonko like two opposite extremes um you know and i think that would be really awesome and really good interesting story and also explains why we saw shanks meeting with the gorosei I think it could not be Shanks at all. It could be this twin brother. That's my uh, popular theory, and I think that's definitely who it could be. A lot of people are saying it might be the man marked by Flame, um, who was mentioned briefly in one chapter, I think, and maybe a few times. Hasn't been mentioned recently, but um, as someone that's needed to be met or talked to in order to progress toward the One Piece, um, there's a couple of theories going around of who that man marked by Flame is. And that would also explain why they're obscuring his face here, because... Um, you know, they don't want to show the flame marks, you know. But um, I think the, the, the huge popular theory at the time was that it was Scopper, Kabit, Stopper Gaban, who was um, a member of Roger's crew. Um, I think that's plausible. A lot of people were saying the man marked by flame is Saul, um, which would make this not him. This wouldn't be the man marked by flame. Um, could be an entirely new unknown character that we didn't know about. This could also be someone that's still alive from rocks, the Rocks Pirates that we haven't yet met. I, I think those are all very plausible theories. It was just something very interesting that immediately caught my eye when reading the chapter. I'm like, who is that? The first time I read it. But yeah, just like, this felt like the real, like, powerful conclusion to this arc. I know we're going to have a, probably a few chapters of, you know, meandering around, like, to try to get out. Like, probably, like, a few more... I'd say, like, if we get more than three, we'll be a little overkill, but I, I feel like we're pretty much out of here. Um, making Egghead likely one of, if not the best arc in the whole series, maybe? Um, I don't know. I think it's, like, you know, it's probably tied up. I mean, it could just, you know, it could still have a, a shit ending, but, like, I, I mean, it's pretty much tied up there with me for, like, Water 7 and Slobby, like, you know, uh, which is currently untopped in my opinion um wano was close for me wano was so close to being my favorite and uh it did not end the best there were a lot of issues and i think you know i've said this in past reviews but like oda understood that there was a lot of issues there and that's why he took a few months what did he do a few months break or something to sort of like like fix where the story was going and after that break we immediately got a lot of like sharp retcons like Yamato not joining the crew um you know Zunisha walking away like things like that like 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 he was very much cleaning up there after he realized he made a lot of mistakes and um that makes Wano lower in my opinion I feel like but it's you know still very masterful um but yeah I guess that's, that's, that's that about wraps up this review this was such a beautiful concluding chapter I feel like to this arc and it's gonna be one people remember for a long time it very much felt like the culmination of Vegapunk speech this whole time, I feel like it felt like, you know, the same energy as the One Piece, the One Piece is real. It felt very much that energy and vibe. I think this scene is going to be remembered very fondly like that scene. So yeah, that about wraps up this review. Um, so exciting. I hate that there's a break next week, but this felt like if there was any chapter to follow up with the break. This was the one. This was like the big, juicy, epic chapter. So very happy we got it. So yeah, that's about it. Thanks for watching.